can sharing, please. So I'm Matt Koklowski. I'm a fisheries biologist with the uh, Connecticut Deep Fisheries Division in the Habitat Conservation and Enhancement Program. And uh, today I'm gonna give an introduction to stream ecology. So I just shared my screen. Can everyone see that? Okay. So what is stream ecology? Stream ecology is the study of aquatic organisms and how they interact with other organisms and their environment in uh, flowing water systems. In Connecticut, we're blessed to live in a uh, really a water rich state and there's streams all around us. You may not realize it, but you're probably not very far from a stream. Uh, there's a lot of diversity in the streams in the state and uh, they range from small headwater streams that are only a few feet wide that you can step across all the way up to the Connecticut River, which is several hundred feet across and it might look more like a lake to some people than a, than a river. So I think a good place to start when thinking about stream ecology is at the watershed level. A watershed is defined as the area of land that drains all of the streams and rainfall to a common outlet, such as the outflow of a reservoir, the mouth of a bay, or any point along a stream channel. So uh, the important thing to remember here is that water always follows the, leaf, the path of least resistance downhill. And as any drop of rain starts to fall downhill, starts to flow downhill, it'll meet up with other raindrops. So they eventually uh, form into rivers. And all the rivers within a watershed or, or at any point along where a river is flowing, all the, the whole area upstream of that point is uh, what you would call the watershed. So, Within any given watershed, there are going to be a number of different streams that make up the watershed. Uh, at the very upper end of the watershed, what you have are the headwater streams. And uh, uh, th these streams are the, are the smallest unit within the watershed, and there's no smaller tributaries that flow into them. So. Um, Uh, what I'm going to talk about here is stream order, and that uh, it's basically a, uh, a means of comparing uh, the size of a stream and its relative position within the watershed to other streams. So those headwater streams at the top of the watershed are what are known as first order streams. And when you have two first order streams combined with each other, they, they form a second order stream. And when you have two second order streams flow into each other, they form a third order stream and so on. So it's important to note that when you have a first order stream joining with a second order stream, that the resulting water body is still gonna be a second order stream until it reaches another second order stream. So the table on the lower left-hand side of the stream, lower left-hand side of the screen gives you a relative idea on how big you can expect a stream to be based on what order stream it is in Connecticut. So the biggest stream in Connecticut is the Connecticut River, which is uh, a sixth order stream. Zooming in a bit from the watershed level, uh, you move to the stream corridor, and that is comprised of a couple of different uh, areas. The first is the riparian zone. The riparian zone is the transition area between uh, upland terrestrial habitats and the stream channel itself. Uh, zooming in a little bit more, you have the floodplain. And the floodplain is comprised of all of the land area that has the potential to uh, be inundated or covered in water during a, a storm event or a rain event. And then zooming in a little bit further, you come mm -hmm. to the stream channel itself. And that's what most people really think of as a stream uh, is the, the channel. And that's comprised of the stream bed, which is the bottom of the stream and its banks, which are the, the edges of the stream. One of the ways that uh, the stream channel is characterized is by measuring its bankful depth and width. And that's uh, basically a measure of how wide and deep a stream is 
during normal flow conditions. And a term that you might hear come up often in stream ecology is the thaw wig. And that is the deepest point within the stream channel. So one of the things you'll find as you study streams is that they're really dynamic environments and that they're constantly changing over time. There are two major processes that really drive this change. And those are erosion or degradation, which is actually a wearing away of the, the bed and banks of the stream and deposition or aggradation, which is, is uh, when sediments settle out and you actually have buildup occurring along the stream edges or diff in different areas in the stream. And these processes are really driven by a number of factors, including geology. Uh, so what's the surrounding landscape like? What is it bedrock or is it highly erodible soils? that can influence uh, how these processes affect the stream. Another thing it's influenced by is the slope, how steep is the stream channel, the velocity, how fast is water moving within the stream channel, the discharge, what is the overall volume of water within a stream, the substrate type, which is uh, what, what are the materials that make up the stream bed, is it uh, boulders, which are really large rocks? Is it gravel, smaller rocks? Or is it fine materials like, like sand, silt, and clay? All these materials are going to have different, uh, a different range of water velocities that are going to be able to move these materials around within the stream. And there is also biotic factors that, that can influence how a stream channel moves. Uh, well, an example of this can be uh, if a beaver builds a dam across a stream channel, that's going to uh, slow down the water, uh, cause some ponding, and it may actually create uh, lead to the creation of some new stream channels. And the surrounding land use is also going to influence the channel evolution. So on the right hand side of the screen, you have uh, an image depicting a meandering stream channel. And what you'll note in that image is that there's a dark blue line that's kind of winding its way down the stream. And that area is actually the thaw wig of the stream. That's where the deepest water is going to be, the most water, and the fastest water velocities within the channel. What you'll see is that when the thaw wig line is actually closest to the bank, it's going to it, it it it's the area of the stream that has the most energy. So when it's close to the bank, it's going to start eroding away and wearing away those stream the stream bank. In contrast, uh, when the the, the portion of the stream where the thaw wag is furthest from the inside of a bend, you'll start to see some deposition occurring there. So over time, when these two processes are occurring at, uh, at the same time, you'll have er erosion eating into the bank. And in parallel, you'll have deposition building up the opposite bank. What will end up happening is the stream channel is going to end up meandering or sort of snaking back and forth within its, uh, within its valley or floodplain. So, uh, and th this is gonna be influenced by all the factors that I just talked about. So here's another example, really driving the point home at, about how streams are dynamic systems. So at any point in a stream, you can expect to see different uh, flow conditions throughout the year. These flow conditions can be influenced by a number of things. Uh, one of those is how much groundwater is, is uh, coming into the stream. Also, how much surface water is coming into the stream via rainfall or snow melt. And also, what's going on in the surrounding landscape. So uh, in these four images, you can see uh, an example of a, a point on a stream in southeastern Connecticut at, uh, during four flow conditions. So one of the ways we think about discharge in a stream, that's how much water is flowing through the stream, is by looking at a hydrograph. So the hydrograph basically shows how much discharge is in a stream at any given point in time. Different types of streams respond differently to storm events. For example, the, uh, in an urban environment where there's a lot of impervious surfaces like rooftops or roadways where water it really can't penetrate into those surfaces at all. What, what ends up happening is the water 
is quickly uh, drawn away from those surfaces and it is quickly uh, carried into the streams. And you end up seeing quite a big slug of water come through the system all at once. Uh, you'll see the, the flow go from um, a small amount of base flow all the way up to this big spike, followed by a pretty uh, rapid drop off back to base flow. So during that big spike, there's a lot of erosive force and it's, uh, it's a pretty chaotic time in the stream when that big pulse of water comes through. In contrast, in rural streams where you have a lot of uh, vegetation in the riparian zone, the, uh, the stream is gonna respond a lot differently to a rain, rain event. As the rainfall hits the, the leaves and the branches of trees, it's gonna be slowed down. And when it eventually makes its way to the ground, it's gonna, some of that water is gonna actually infiltrate into the ground and, and it's further slowed before it reaches the stream. So what you see is a, a much more gradual increase to that peak stream flow and a much more gradual uh, decline after that. So it's, it's a much more stable condition when, when, you're in, uh, when you're in a more rural stream uh, environment or a more natural setting. There are a couple of broad uh, classifications for uh, the types of streams that you'll find. The first is ephemeral streams. Ephemeral streams are streams that only flow during rain events. The next category is intermittent streams. These are seasonally flowing streams that, that are either fed by surface waters or groundwater. Uh, for example, you might have streams that are only flowing during, during the winter or early spring when, sn when snow is melting. And the third broad category of streams are perennial streams. And these are streams that have constant flow during normal years. And this is really what most people think of when they, when they think of a stream. There are a lot of different uh, abiotic factors that can impact or influence uh, what kind of life, what kind of organisms can live in a, a given stream. And uh, Here's just a few examples of those factors, and those include the light, and the light uh, can influence what sort of plants and algae, uh, primary producer sort of organisms uh, can live within a stream, and uh, the light will also influence what kind of temperatures you might find in the stream. Certain organisms are uh, more tolerant to warmer temperatures than others, and, and you'll find that there's specific organisms, uh, particularly certain species of fish that don't do well in warmer streams. Uh, another factor is the level of dissolved oxygen in the water. Certain species are more tolerant to lower levels of oxygen, so they'll be more likely to live in, in uh, specific uh, high quality stream environments than, than in areas with lower dissolved oxygen. And the last abiotic, uh, abiotic factor that I'll briefly touch on is pH, and that's the uh, relative acidity level within a stream. And some organisms, uh, ideally, uh, water level or waters are, are generally around a pH of seven. So once you get too far below that uh, or too far above that, some, you start to have some issues where uh, some of the aquatic organisms are no longer very happy in that environment. So now we're going to move on to the stream food web. There are really two major types of uh, production that fuel the stream food web. The first is autochthonous production, and that's uh, production that occurs within the stream itself. So in certain streams when there, where there's enough nutrients and sunlight, uh, there's certain organisms that are able to, to make use of those resources and and grow and sort of jumpstart the food web there. And those would be the, the algaes and vascular plants and things like that. And the other main driver of the stream food web are the allochthonous inputs. And these are inputs that are coming from outside the stream channel itself. So that could be things uh, like branches, large woody debris, leaves, or bugs, anything else that is either falls into the stream or is carried into the stream by runoff. So the, the first group of organisms that we'll talk about are the primary producers. Uh, here again, you'll see that the, some of these uh, 
are are largely going to be responsible for allochthonous uh, production, and that's going to be the terrestrial vegetation. So any leaves or plant material that falls into the the stream from outside of the stream channel itself, uh, and then you have the the autochthonous uh, primary producers, which consist of the phytoplankton, which are the floating algaes like diatoms or cyanobacteria. Then you have the paraphyton, which is uh, algae that actually lives on the surface of rocks and, and woody debris, any sort of surfaces that are uh, on the bottom of the stream. And then you have the macrophytes, which are the larger vascular plants that uh, you might see in some slower sections of streams. The next group of organisms is the, uh, the microorganisms. So these, cons these are, uh, consist of bacteria, fungi, and zooplankton. And these organisms generally either feed on uh, directly on those allochthonous inputs that fall into the stream, or they're able to feed on directly on some of the, uh, the, the algaes and plants that are, are produced within the stream. These guys are generally very small and, and you, you, you don't really see them with the naked eye. The next major group of organisms are the macroinvertebrates. And the macroinvertebrates are made up of any insects that are in the stream, as well as uh, uh, mollusks, uh, snails, crayfish, uh, mussels, things like that. So in, within these macroinvertebrates, uh, they're often broken up into different functional feeding groups. So the first group is the scrapers, which generally make a living by uh, eating algae off the surfaces of rocks and, and other things in the stream. The next group are the shredders, which make a living by eating any sort of larger material that falls in the stream, like they'll feed directly on leaves or sticks that fall in the stream. The, the next group are the collectors, and these guys are organisms that eat any sort of really small, fine organic material off the stream bed. And then you have the filterers, which eat that same really fine stuff, but they're actually, they either have adaptations on their body or they're able to build structures that help them collect uh, those materials from the water column itself as it's flowing past them. And then the last group are the predators, which uh, basically eat everybody else. And macroinvertebrates are uh, an important group that is often used in uh, what's known as rapid bioassessments, where you're able to just uh, take quick samples collecting what sort of macro and vertebrates are in a given a stream. And based on the, the, the groups of organisms that you see, you're able to get a, a really quick index on what kind of water quality is in the stream. Because there's certain uh, macro and vertebrates that are much more tolerant to lower quality water conditions than others. So if you just find those, you know that you're, you're not in a high quality system versus if, you, if you're finding a mix of organisms, especially that includes uh, some of the least tolerant organs, organisms, you'll know that you have a higher quality resource there. The next group of organisms, and it's probably what most people think of when they're thinking of critters running around in streams, are the fish. And fish can be divided up into a couple of different major groups. Uh, the first are the resident fish species. And this can be further divided into uh, the fluvial specialists and the habitat generalists. The fluvial general, uh, sorry, the fluvial specialists are species that are specifically adapted to living in stream environments, and they really don't do well in, in any sort of still water conditions. So species like the long-nosed dace, they really have a, a streamlined body that allows them to move easily within the current. And uh, the slimy sculpin has these big saucer-shaped fins, which allow it to really hug the 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 stream bed and and uh, allow it so it's not washed away in in heavy current. It can it has an easier time of of hanging on to the bottom based on the, the fin shape and the overall shape of its body. In contrast, you have the habitat generalists, which really uh, they'd prefer to live in in still waters like lakes and ponds, 
but if certain habitat uh, conditions persist in the stream, they, they have no issue with living in a stream environment. And to further refine that within the, uh, the resident species, you have what's known as cold water species and warm water species. And two examples of cold water species are the slimy sculpin and brook trout. And these species uh, really don't do well in, in waters that get much over 70 degrees for any, any long period of time. And uh, because of that, these, these species are generally only found in really high quality streams that have good uh, riparian buffers with a lot of vegetation along their banks. So if you find these species in the stream, that's another thing that can indicate good water quality. The next uh, group of fish species are the diadromous species. These are the species that spend a portion of their life in freshwater and as well as a portion of their life out in the ocean. So anadromous fish like blueback herring, Atlantic salmon, and sea lamprey, these are all species that actually spawn in freshwaters. They'll live there for a little while as juveniles, and then they'll move out to the ocean where they'll grow and mature before coming back to freshwater to complete their life cycle. Catadromous species do the opposite. We have one species like that in Connecticut, the American eel, which uh, comes uh, in the early spring into uh, any rivers and streams in the state or anywhere along the eastern seaboard of the United States. They're actually, they look like little worms at that stage. They'll, they're, they move upstream. They're able to, to uh, actually climb some pretty impressive surfaces. They can, anything that's wet, they can move up. So they'll, they'll grow and mature in freshwater systems. And then uh, when they're ready to spawn, they move back out and uh, spawn out in the ocean in the Sargasso Sea. There are a couple of other, uh, there, are, there are definitely another uh, bunch of groups of animals that, uh, that are important parts of the stream ecosystem. I'm not gonna go into much detail with them today, but you have mammals, uh, some common examples are beavers or river otters. You have amphibians like the two-line salamander, uh, birds like the, the common merganser, and reptiles like the, the wood turtle. There's a lot of different species that uh, really rely on uh, streams and flowing systems for, for their life cycles as well, even though they're, they don't necessarily need to be in the water all the time. Now I'm just gonna touch on a few of the really common stream habitat types. So uh, the first one is the riffle. Riffles are generally characterized as shallow, swift, and turbulent areas. These areas uh, generally have higher oxygen levels and they really favor those fluvial specialist species that are adapted to living within the, within the flow. Pools are the deep and slow sections of the rivers. And these areas kind of can be a refuge area for some species and, and they're really where the, uh, habitat generalist sort of species are able to make their living in the stream environment. And run habitats are kind of like an in-between a riffle and a pool. So runs have moderate depth and water velocity with mostly laminar or smooth flow. And uh, in general, you'll find pools at the outside of a meander bend riffles at the transition zone between meanders and runs between the pools and riffles. And in general, the, uh, you'll find that uh, riffles are the highest gradient uh, areas of the stream. The, the runs are moderate and the pools are the, the lowest gradient areas of the stream. So the flattest sections of the stream. And now I'm gonna briefly touch on the river continuum concept. This basically describes how stream channels change as you move from the headwaters downstream. So in the upper portions of, the stream, of, of a stream in the headwaters, you'll find that the, the water uh, is generally shallower, higher velocity, steeper slope. You'll find larger substrates. Uh, oftentimes you'll have lower water temperatures, higher dissolved oxygen levels. And these, this portion of the stream is almost entirely gonna be driven by 
a lock than as inputs, things falling into the stream, because there's really not a lot of sunlight in most healthy uh, headwater systems that reaches the stream bed there, Is it because there's a lot of shade there. Uh, as you move further downstream, the river starts to change. You'll, you'll see deeper water, slower water, finer sediments, and the, uh, the uh, autochthonous production starts to become more important. And you'll find uh, certain species of uh, fish and other organisms will, will be found in different sections of, of the stream. And in the lowest portions of the stream, you'll often find the, the most tolerant uh, species, the ones that can tolerate warmer water temperatures, lower dissolved oxygen, and, and that sort of thing. So in any given stream, it's gonna be a highly variable environment, uh, both in space and time, and as you move downstream as well. So now I'm just gonna to briefly touch on a few of the, the threats to stream ecosystems. The first one is a loss of connectivity. Most stream organisms really uh, need to be able to use a variety of, of habitats throughout their life cycle. And when you, when you do something that uh, breaks up their access to those habitats, that can really impair, impair them. So an example of that is uh, you have a lot of improperly designed stream crossings in the state where there's culverts that uh, eventually uh, lead to erosion and a, a perched condition where there's a drop at the outlet of the culvert. And anybody that's downstream most organisms are not gonna be able to move upstream through those culverts. Another example of, of this loss of connectivity and fragmentation is uh, when you create a dam on a stream. Uh, the next thing that uh, is a threat to stream ecosystems is habitat alterations. So anytime that, uh, that you're doing any sort of work within a stream, you're at risk of, uh, having some negative impacts therein. And I, th I think the picture with the excavator there is probably pretty obvious and people often might get concerned if they see that, uh, seeing some sort of equipment in the stream, that that is uh, gonna have negative impacts on the stream. And, and actually uh, way back in the 50s, a common practice actually was to take out all the irregularities in the stream the thought was that the best thing to do with a stream was to just get water through it as fast as possible. And now a lot of the work that we're doing to restore stream systems is actually uh, the exact opposite of that. So we, we do sometimes use heavy equipment to improve habitat in the stream to try to restore some of the, the, uh, the different features like uh, boulders, uh, deeper areas of the stream, because otherwise, uh, a lot of the past activities resulted in just having a pretty featureless stream with low quality habitat. So another threat to stream ecosystems is changes in land use. So uh, when I went through the example of the urban versus a rural stream, over time a lot of our uh, a lot of a lot of the land area surrounding some streams has become increasingly urbanized. So that unfortunately is having some negative impacts on the streams. Uh, the next threat to stream ecosystems are invasive species. Uh, the fish that you see in the middle of the bottom of the screen there is a relatively recent invader to the state, the knobfin sculpin. And we found that in a few streams in the state and it has really caused a shift in the, uh, the fish species that are in the streams that that, that, that uh, guy has been found in. And one of the last major threats uh, to stream ecosystems is climate change. So along with climate change, we're seeing differences in uh, rainfall patterns, as well as, as temperatures that uh, specifically are putting some of those cold water, uh, less tolerant species at risk of uh, being negatively impacted by that. So I know this is a really broad topic and I went through everything kind of quickly to try to get it in in this time period. So um, I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has at this point.
Mindy, you're muted. Thanks, Kelsey. <laughs> um, so if anyone doesn't have any questions for Matt, or if you think of questions after watching the video, because we did record this, um, you can either email us at ctenvirothon at gmail.com and we'll forward that along to him. Oh, we didn't do that. Or I don't know, Matt, if you had your email in your slides. I um, don't, but I can. Let me uh, throw it on there right now. Just uh... yeah. Mindy, there are a couple questions in the chat. Oh. All right, so we have. There we go. How do you know when stream order changes if not looking at a map? Um, that is really something that uh, you 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 would be need you would need to. Uh, look at a map to get a good sense on on uh, which order a stream would be. So you need to know a little bit about what the other, what other streams are out there in the watershed. And, and uh, so it's, I don't think that there's an easy way for you to, to know exactly what order a stream is when you're, when you're not looking at a map, unfortunately. On the last slide, what was, what was between habitat, alteration and invasive species. Uh, let's see. Habitat alteration in invasive species. I'm, I'm not sure I uh, know what's being asked, sorry. Um, so I couldn't see change in land use um, the way the when it fills the screen, you can't read under the map of the state of Connecticut. So oh, now that I see it smaller, I can see that was just uh, land use. Oh, sorry. So you, you just couldn't see the change in land use. There's small text on the screen as well. And that's just the where I pulled that map from. Awesome, and then we have our terrestrial invasive species having an impact on streams. They can to some degree, especially uh, if they're growing along stream banks. Um, the, to some, uh, they probably serve some positive role in that they actually can serve to stabilize stream banks, but what's, uh, so, so they're holding the stream banks together, but one of the, the, uh, the negative things that terrestrial invasive species can do is result in an overall loss of diversity along the stream banks. So in particular streams that rely on a lot of uh, allochthonous inputs, uh, those streams could be at risk of losing some of the diversity and in, in the types of inputs that, that come into the stream. And, uh, the, the riparian habitat might be of a lower quality based on uh, if, if there's just a monoculture of those invasive species there. Um, and then the last question, what exactly is a riffle pool sequence? So a riffle pool sequence, let me go back to my this slide here. A riffle pool sequence is basically uh, what you see when uh, it's an alternating pattern between um, riffles and pools where you'll find pools at the outside edges of a, a meander bend. A riffle will occur at the transition area where the, the stream uh, kind of flip-flops and the pool uh, transitions to the opposite bank at the next meander bend. So the, the sequence is, the riffles are, are basically providing uh, the transition area where the fall wig switches from one bank to the other. Hopefully that, that answered the question. <laughs> and are there any additional questions? You can either unmute yourself or type in the chat box. 
So you use the term fall wig. Can you spell that? Yes. T H A L W E G. I have a question, but I, I don't know if. Okay. It's like, how do this animal like survive in the winter? Because it's like too cold. Like the fish. How, how do they survive? <laughs> So uh, fish, what, what actually happens with fish is they're cold-blooded animals. So they're able to slow down their metabolism. So a, lo a lot of their feeding requirements go down quite a bit during the winter. And so they, they don't need to eat as much. And what a lot of them will do will actually, is actually to seek out refuge in the, the calmer areas of the stream. So you might find certain species that will tend to con con yeah, congregate in the pools or the deepest available sections of the stream or in areas along the edges of the stream. So they, they generally slow down, they don't need to eat as much and they try to stay out of the current to, to lower their energy demands during the winter. Oh, that's cool, thank you. And I, I entered my email in the chat box in case anyone wants to reach out after as well. Awesome, any more questions? All right, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> Thank you again, Matt, for your presentation. Um, We'll have it posted on our YouTube so everyone can reference it again and again. Any further questions, you can either email us at Envirathon and we'll forward the question to him, or you can use the email in the chat box, which is 